Protective relays are placed on the system to reduce the number of alternate links to a minimum. They do so by avoiding equipment damage or by limiting it to the single component that may be in trouble. The relays quickly locate the fault and trip circuit breakers which will interrupt the flow of current into the defective component, thereby isolating it. Two benefits of this quick isolation are, first, it minimizes or prevents damage to the faulted component, thus reducing the time and expense of repairs, and permits quicker restoration into service. The second benefit is that the quick response minimizes the seriousness and duration of the fault's interference with normal operation of the unfaulted parts of the system, allowing them to continue to supply their normal power. In many cases, the unfaulted parts of the power system can supply the additional power to replace what was normally supplied through the faulted component. The protective relay uses current and voltage instrument transformers to acquire information about the system, such that a fault can be located. The type and location of the instrument transformers, the circuit breaker which is to be tripped by the protective relay when it operates, and the signal level required to operate the relay is selected when the relay is applied to the power system. The function of protective relaying is to immediately remove any component of a power system when it suffers a fault that might result in damage to property or unsafe conditions. In addition, protective relays can provide information on the locations and types of failures that occur. This information not only helps with equipment repair, but also provides the means for analyzing the effectiveness of the protection scheme. We should note that protective relays are not always part of a protection scheme. Fusing, reclosers, and sectionalizers are employed in some cases to keep costs down. Circuit breakers are located between each power system component, which makes it possible to isolate and disconnect the faulty component. If a breaker isn't installed between two adjacent components, both components will need to be disconnected for a failure in either one. One of the protection engineer's most powerful tools is the concept of zones of protection. The boundary of a protective zone represents the region that a particular protective element covers. It is necessary for these zones to overlap to ensure proper protection. If two zones did not overlap and a fault occurred at the boundaries of these zones, it is possible that no relays would be tripped. For failures within the overlap area, more breakers will be tripped than needed to disconnect the faulty element. However, the overlap areas are relatively small and the probability of failure in this region is very low. Therefore, the tripping of too many breakers for a fault in the overlap area will be infrequent. The preferred practice is that adjacent protective zones overlap around the circuit breaker, so that for failures anywhere other than in the region of the overlap, the minimum number of circuit breakers will be tripped. If the zones of protection are set up such that overlap occurs on only one side of the breaker, the relaying equipment of the zone that overlaps the breaker must also be able to trip the breakers of the neighboring zone in order to completely disconnect faults in certain areas. This can be illustrated in the following example. For a fault located as shown, the circuit breakers of zone B will trip, but because the fault is outside zone A, the relaying equipment of zone B will need to send a trip signal to the breaker in zone A. A potential drawback of this is that the breaker in zone A will be tripped unnecessarily for faults occurring in zone B to the right of breaker C. There are four characteristics required by any protective relaying system to ensure that it performs its function properly. These are sensitivity, selectivity, speed, and reliability. The relay must be sensitive enough to operate under the minimum conditions expected. In any power system at various times of the day and during various seasons of the year, the load varies over a wide range. To meet these changing requirements, various combinations of generating sources are switched in and out of the system to provide efficient operation. The relay must be sensitive enough to detect a fault on the system when the minimum amount of power is being generated on the system. The selectivity of a protective relay is its ability to trip the minimum number of circuit breakers to clear a fault. The relay must be able to select faults in its own zone of protection and ignore faults in adjoining zones. Some relaying schemes are inherently selective, that is, they are unaffected by faults outside of their own zone. Other types of relaying, which operate with a time delay for faults outside of the protected zone, are said to be relatively selective. 
The speed at which a damaged power system component is isolated from the rest of the system has a direct bearing on the damage done by a short circuit and, consequently, the cost and the delay in making repairs. Therefore, speed is essential for most relaying applications. The speed of operation also has a direct effect on the general stability of the power system. During a short circuit fault, the rest of the power system can transmit less power because the various sources of generation tend to go out of synchronism. The shorter amount of time a fault is allowed to persist, the smaller its effect is on synchronism or stability of the system. For a protection scheme to perform properly, it must be reliable. With respect to protective relaying, reliability is made up of two components, dependability and security. It is important to understand the difference between dependability and security. Dependability is the amount of certainty that a relay will clear the faults that it is programmed to clear, whereas security is the amount of certainty that the same relay will not react to faults that fall outside of its zone of protection or react incorrectly for a fault within its zone of protection. Generally, when the dependability of a relay is increased, the security decreases and vice versa. For example, Let's increase the sensitivity of one of the relays in our example protection scheme to be as dependable as possible. Now when a fault occurs within this relay's protective zone, our relay is sure to identify and clear the fault. However, when a fault occurs outside of this relay's established zone of protection, it attempts to clear the fault. This is because the relay has been made so sensitive that it identifies and reacts to faults even though they fall outside of its zone of protection. In general, the most common faults that occur on a power system are short circuits. We will now consider relays that are dedicated to protection against short circuits. There are two groups. The first group are called primary relays and are the first line of defense, while the second are called backup relays and function only when the primary relaying fails. Backup relaying can be classified as either local or remote. Faster reacting backup relaying can be achieved by using local backup relaying systems. This means that the relay providing the backup is located on the same component that is being protected by the primary relay. Local backup protection is often used to protect against failure of both the primary relaying system and the associated circuit breaker. The only potential drawback is that local backup relaying often uses the same CTs, VTs, circuit breakers, etc., which can fail likely resulting in both the primary and local backup relay to also fail. Duplicate Systems On high voltage systems, it is a common practice to duplicate the protection systems to ensure proper operation if a failure occurs. In some cases, only the relays are duplicated, while in other cases, the entire protection system is duplicated. This is the preferred choice when economically justifiable. Let's take a look at several backup strategies being used within one power system transmission line. Here we see that relays R1 through R6 are the primary relaying. The D group of relays is the duplicate system, and the L group of relays is the local backup relaying. When a fault occurs at location F, relays R1 and R2 are the primary relays that are programmed to identify and clear the fault. The fault at location F is within R2's zone of protection. Let's assume that when the fault occurs, R2 fails to operate. The duplicate relay, D2, should have operated at the same time. However, let's assume that relay D2 of the duplicate system has also failed. The local backup relay, L2, should now operate a short time after the primary and duplicate relays due to its coordination with them. If all three fail, the backup function of relays R3 through R6 is to provide remote backup to R2, D2, and L2. Relays R3 to R6 will initiate breaker failure logic to trip all the adjacent breakers, which are feeding this fault if the primary or backup protection fails. Let's look at an example of a breaker failure protective element. In this example, the protective relays operate correctly but the associated circuit breaker fails to clear the fault because of some malfunction within the breaker or its control circuits. The fault will now remain on the system until some other means is used to clear it. In our example, the primary or backup relays start a timer once a fault has been detected. The timer will then time out 
and send a trip signal to all breakers that can feed the failed breaker with power. Until the early 80s, almost all protective relays in use were based on an electromechanical principle of operation. Their designs were limited in configuration and most supported only one protective element, resulting in a requirement for many expensive electromechanical relays for a protective solution. This, coupled with the expense of periodic calibration, translated into high initial cost for an electromechanical relaying solution, in addition to high maintenance costs associated with the mandatory periodic calibration of each electromechanical relay within the system. In electromechanical relays, a moving part like a disc or a plunger is placed in a magnetic field produced by the input signals known as actuating signals or measured quantity. The disc or the plunger moves and touches a contact when the intensity of the magnetic field exceeds a preset limit. Electromechanical relays fall into one of four styles or categories depending on the type of moving part. These are the plunger, the hinged armature, the induction disc, and the induction cup. The plunger and hinged armature operate under the principle of magnetic attraction. The armature is attracted into a coil or to the pole face of an electromagnet. This principle works with either alternating or direct current measured quantities. The induction disc and induction cup work under the principle of magnetic induction. Torque is developed in a movable rotor in the same way that it is produced in an induction motor, which means that they can only be used with alternating current measured quantities. Now let's quickly review the theory of operation of each style of electromechanical relay. The plunger style of construction consists of a bar or cylinder armature, which is attracted axially into a solenoid coil. The armature carries the moving portion of the contact, which meets a fixed contact once the current magnitude of the measured quantity exceeded a preset amount. The hinged armature construction, which also includes the cantilever and beam type of construction, consists of a flat plate or bar type of armature, which pivots at a fixed point when attracted to the pole face of an electromagnet. The armature carries the moving portion of the contact, which meets a fixed contact when the armature is picked up. An advantage of the plunger and hinged armature style of construction is that they have no inherent time delay, hence they are used for functions which require instantaneous operation. As the hinged armature relays operate, the length of the magnetic air gap changes, resulting in a slightly greater force required to just pick up the armature than the amount of force that is required to release the armature. This translates into a difference in the amount of measured quantities for pickup and dropout, which is a slight impairment for this style of relay. This shortcoming also applies to the plunger style of construction, but to a lesser extent. The induction disc element consists of a metallic disc of copper or aluminum, which rotates between the pole faces of an electromagnet. There are two styles of induction disc, the shaded pole style and the watt metric style, each having its own principles of operation. Shaded pole. A portion of the electromagnet pole face is short-circuited by a copper ring or coil, which causes the flux in the shaded section to lag the flux in the unshaded section. Once the measured quantity exceeds a preset level, the induced torque on the disc will cause it to rotate, resulting in contact closure. A spring on the disc allows the contacts to open once the measured quantity falls below a preset level. Watt metric. This style uses one set of coils above the disc and another set of coils below the disc. In either case, the moving contact is carried on the rotating shaft of the disc element. The induction disc style of relay is always used as a time delay element because of the inertia of the moving disc. The time delay feature is added by means of a permanent magnet. The disc rotating between the poles of this magnet causes an induction drag. The induction cup element consists of a metallic cylinder with one end closed like a cup. The cup rotates in an annular air gap between the pole faces of electromagnets and a central core. The induction cup unit uses four or eight poles spaced symmetrically about the circumference of the cup. Due to the low inertia of the rotating parts of the relay, this style is capable of high-speed operation, hence it is used for functions requiring instantaneous operation. The multiplicity of poles also permits measurement of more than one electrical quantity.
In the 1970s, many relay manufacturers introduced electronic relays, which simply emulated their electromechanical predecessors, and in many cases, the design still required costly periodic calibration. In the early 80s, the microprocessor-based relay, or digital relay, was introduced. Standard features such as multiple element support, low maintenance, built-in high-speed communication, waveform, event log, improved element performance, and built-in programmable logic controller functionality has enabled the digital relay to revolutionize the protection industry. Let's take a closer look at the operation of a modern microprocessor-based relay. Through the use of current and voltage transformers, the relay receives information about the power system. These measured quantities need to be converted into symmetrical components. Filtering removes high-frequency noise and DC offsets. Analog to digital converters then take this analog waveform and convert it into a digital quantity. The resulting digital quantity, which is a true replica of the power system quantity, is then input into the microprocessor's active protective elements within the relay. The protective element or elements within the relay initiates the appropriate action based on these quantities and the configuration settings within the relay. These elements may work independent or through the use of logic gates. The type and number of protective elements within a particular relay will depend upon the type of protection application the relay has been designed for. For example, a relay designed to protect a transformer will have some protective elements not found in a relay designed to protect a feeder, and vice versa.